Welcome to this podcast called Curious About Recovery. I am Kirsten Honeyball. I am your host. And in this podcast, I will be diving deep into eating disorders, which are complex and challenging to navigate. So whether you're a sufferer, a professional, a family or loved one of a sufferer, you can join me as I get curious by interviewing professionals, chatting to eating disorder survivors and sharing my personal experience with an eating disorder so that you can better understand various perspectives remove stigma, hear inspiring testimonies, and simply get curious about all things eating disorder related. I would like to put out a trigger warning. These episodes explore the topic of eating disorders and some content may be triggering to listeners. Topics explored may mention, but are not limited to, trauma, diets, food and body types, suicide, mental illness, substance use, self-harm, violence, gender identification topics, and more. Please take care before listening to any episodes. It's important to note that this podcast is not aimed to diagnose, treat, or cure any form of mental illness and should not be seen as a replacement for treatment of eating disorders. Everything said here is expressed in relation to personal and professional opinions and listeners should be encouraged to view these episodes as an open-minded exploration of various possibilities and perspective rather than hard facts and solutions. Please take what applies or resonates with you and leave the rest. And if you're struggling with an eating disorder, don't hesitate to reach out to me at Kirsten at kirstenhoneyball.co.za. Today we have Livy Parker here with us. It's really wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you for being here. She is the owner of Not Your Average Nutritionist. She is a certified eating disorder registered dietitian. She has her master's in nutrition and really just loves helping people relearn how to have a positive relationship to their body through practices like intuitive eating. She is a published author who wrote a book called Permission to Eat for college students about eating disorder recovery in 2019. And in 2021, she reached international bestseller status for her published works. She also loves the arts. So when she's not helping people relearn how to love their bodies and food, she is dancing, singing and acting. She was awarded one of the top 20 under 40 businesswomen in the San Luis Obispo area and is also a proud mother of a little toddler. Libby, thank you so much for being here today. I'd love to know a little bit more about what you do, why it is you do it. Maybe just let me know a little bit about your personal background and what drew you to the work you do today. Yeah, um, I guess I'll give you the short version of this because it could be really long. But I actually entered college pre-vet. Um, I was planning to be equine veterinarian, work with large animals, uh, with a musical theater minor of all things, um, because I am all musicals all the time. I'm actually currently in rehearsals for a musical right now. But very quickly into about my first semester of college, I came to the realization that I don't want to be called out in the middle of the night to in the middle of a blizzard because I was in Wisconsin at the time to go stick my arm up a horse's butt. So what can I do with people? <laughs> and I was good at science. And unbeknownst to me at the time was developing my own restrictive eating disorder. So I was obsessed with reading nutrition facts labels and reading all the weight loss articles in women's magazines and all this stuff. And I was noticing that on some of the bylines of these articles was this credential of dietitian. And I was like, oh, there's a job in helping people with nutrition and at the time losing weight, which is, you know, fast forward, not what I end up doing. But um, that actually made me switch majors to nutrition. That's the short version of how I got into it. Well, it's really wonderful that you have that firsthand experience. And obviously, it wasn't wonderful that you went through it. But I think it's so special when someone can really relate on that level and understand not only what they've read from books, but what they've actually lived through. It's quite interesting that you went into the dietetics field and, you know, you also went 
through personal training and nutrition and all of that. And I wonder if there's kind of a pattern. So I see a lot of people who struggle with eating disorders go into professions where they have to learn about food in the body. So do you think that there was any of this type of thinking when you decided to choose dietetics, nutrition, personal training, and all of that stuff as a career? Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I wanted to learn all of the little tips and tricks and where the calories were so I could keep cutting back because I was definitely restricting. Um, and, you know, as you mentioned in there, I also became a personal trainer while I was in college as well. So my first job kind of out of college while I was applying for dietitian jobs, I was doing personal training and group fitness instruction at a local gym. But yeah, I I mean, I even went to the point of I went to bartending school so I could learn what was in all of the drinks before I turned 21 so that I would know how to choose the lowest calorie options. Like that's how messed up my eating disorder brain was. Uh, I didn't do it because I wanted to get a job as a bartender. <laughs> I did it because I wanted to know what the lowest calorie... Okay, wow. So you definitely confirmed that idea that this is what you initially went in with as a means of maybe trying to control or maybe trying to understand on a level so that you could manipulate or use food and your body to your advantage that would feed the eating disorder. So I'm wondering what shifted in your mindset to go from a place of destruction perhaps and toward healing? Well, I don't think I ever wanted to stop knowing the particulars, but I do think the motive behind them changed because I am very analytical, very scientific. So I love knowing the particulars, but I think that was actually to my advantage in healing. I think the thing that had the most impact for my recovery was actually the nutrition major, which I know is not most people's story with this. I so deeply believe in evidence-based science that as the teachers were showing us like, this is what your human body requires to stay alive. This is what the nutrients do in your body. Sugar is not evil. Like all of the science, I was able to start with the behavioral side and start kind of working myself out of it that way um, by, you know, oh, I, I actually need to eat this much. Oh, I need to include these foods. Oh, these things are not going to hurt me that had the most impact, I think, in my recovery was just understanding the science of what the human body actually needs. And then once I was able to start implementing that, then I was able to go back and work on more of the psychology and the mindset and get into therapy and things like that. But it really was the nutrition major that was the start of my recovery. Yeah, and I think it can be really helpful to understand what's actually going on inside your body on a chemical level, on a molecular level, on a nutrition-based level, so that you can understand why it is you need a certain amount of calories in a day in order to function optimally, or why you need a certain type of food, or you know, even if it's just the matter of busting myths that you see on social media trends and knowing the science behind what's happening in your body can be incredibly beneficial. So in the book that you published called Permission to Eat, is this the kind of stuff that you talk about? Do you talk about nutrition value of things and the science behind the food and the body? Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, My book is my baby. I love it. So Permission to Eat is, it has threads of my story woven into it, especially in the introduction. But the premise is mostly this was after I had worked with eating disorders as a dietitian for about six years. I can't remember exactly. And I had been working at a university health center and I was seeing just students with eating disorders as well as in my private practice, I was seeing primarily college students, young adults. And I was noticing the same patterns happening with all of these students and how the transition into living on your own for the first time, going off to school was especially problematic for eating disorders, either presenting for the first time or flaring up after they thought they were doing well in their recovery. So I wrote this book really from a place of taking the education that I would give all of my one-on-one clients. And it had gotten to a point where certain parts of the education were so commonly talked about that it felt almost scripted. So I'm like, why don't I just write this down? 
So I went ahead and a lot of it is really what I work on with my individual clients. It is exact education and how the body works, how um, we make peace with food, how to work with your professionals. Like if your doctor says that you're fine, but you know, you're not like, how do you handle that? How do you start those conversations? All the things that I guess I wish I had known and I impart on my clients and I, I put it all together in kind of a one-stop shop. Yeah, I can understand the importance of that. I mean, not only for a person who's wanting to recover from an eating disorder, but the educational element of knowing the science behind why you do what you do and why you need to do what you do can be beneficial for anyone wanting to recover their relationship to food in their body or just move into a space where they are thriving optimally. So I'm sure a lot of people come into your consultations with misinformation, diet culture, mentality, or things that they think are optimal for their body that aren't. So what are the kind of myths or things that people come to you about that are maybe misinformed that you'd like to educate others on? Oh my gosh, so many things. Um, I mean, I feel like the biggest one really for the last mm, five to 10 years, I guess, would be everyone is thinking like they can't have carbs. Like the keto diet is so big in America and especially in California, we're this fitness and health obsessed culture, but coming from the wrong sources, of course, as I think most of the world is. And everyone is like, oh my gosh, I can't have bread. I can't have carbs. Everything is gluten-free, keto, paleo, blah, blah, blah. And it's especially scary, not only for the general population, just across the board, but all these people who are working out so much, these athletes are trying to do this with so few carbs in their system. And that's just so dangerous. You know, um, we need carbohydrates <laughs> to, to function, to run our bodies, to have that endurance, you know, let alone for just daily function and brain function. So that's probably the most common thing that I'm seeing. I've definitely recognized that in people that I work with as well is this idea that carbohydrates are quote unquote, bad. There's something that you should avoid or restrict or just completely cut out of your diet, you know, and I recently had a family member come to me and ask, you know, they wanted to achieve a certain weight goal. And they said, should I go on a calorie deficit keto diet? And I was like, that's probably the worst thing that you can do for yourself. And, but I couldn't really, I couldn't really explain to her exactly why. So I'd love you to just explain to me why this might not necessarily be the best way for a person to treat their body if they want to reach their set weight where their body is thriving. And if they want to live a life where they're not conforming to rules and rigidity and fear, basically. Oh, okay. Let's get into it because <laughs> it is a bad idea. I think first we need to look at the context of where these diets are coming from. So the keto or ketogenic diet was named and really studied, um, I think in the 1920s. And it was found that this diet, this very specific particular diet of getting into ketosis through drastically reducing carbohydrates. And it, this this particular diet was found to be beneficial for a very, very tiny specific group of people, children with a specific type of ep epilepsy or seizure disorder. And it was found that by having a high fat, low carb diet, they were able to create function in this misfiring part of the brain. That is the only population in which this diet has been proven beneficial. It was never intended to be for the general public. It was never a healthy diet. We don't know how it affected the rest of these epileptic children's bodies. We don't know the long-term effects on their heart or anything like that. It was never intended to be a weight loss diet. So I think what's happened, just kind of watching the trends of diets, um, particularly I you know, I've watched, you know, through my mom dieting and reading everything like from the 1980s on, the trends were low fat in the 80s and 90s. And then people were finding that by, you know, taking the fat out of products and then putting in more sugar to replace texture, 
that they weren't losing weight. So they're like, oh, well, then carbs obviously must be the problem. And so then they were trying to go with lower carb things. So I, I believe that there's very cyclical diet patterns that we see. So I'm pretty sure that coming up, protein is going to be the evil thing because we've done fat, we've done carbs, we're going to go. That's just my little premonition. But also we need to think about like, what do people love to eat? What are the really palatable foods? We love our carbs, right? Like cookies, chips, like whatever, things that are really easy to eat that create serotonin, the things that we really crave, we love. Those are all very high carbohydrate foods. And so how do we theoretically lose weight? Well, mostly through calorie deprivation, which I'm not telling anyone to do, please don't. Um, But how do we do that? Typically by telling ourselves we can't have something. So if we cut out all of our favorite foods, which are the high carb ones, people generally lose weight, at least initially, right? So I think that was kind of the spawn of a lot of these low carb diets. I'm kind of giving you a history lesson into this, I guess. Uh, So keto or ketogenic took that a step further in that people are finding that in the state of ketosis, our body had to rely on fats breaking down into what are called ketone bodies as a source of energy. When we are so, so, so deprived of carbs, that's how our body was running. Now, what I think a lot of people fail to say when they're talking about the keto diet in very general terms is that this is actually very, uh, for lack of a better word, toxic to the body, especially to the brain to have this flood of ketone bodies. And for diabetics, this would be deadly, you know, diabetic ketoacidosis. If we get to a place where we're creating ketones, like your diabetes and your pancreas are so malfunctioning that you're probably going to die. So absolutely people who are diabetic should not be doing keto. I also think it's important to point out that most people who are doing this fad keto diet are not actually getting all of the way to ketosis because that would require essentially no carbs. It's it's very hard to get to. So when we're, we're cutting down these carbs, the theory is that our body is running off of our stored fat uh, or the fat that we're consuming. And I think this is where people really get into that mindset of, oh, it's got to be just calories in versus calories out. And that's not how the body likes to work because especially as you mentioned in the keto plus calorie deprivation, our body becomes very thrifty. It actually slows down our metabolism. It burns fewer calories on a day-to-day basis because we're taking in less food and because we're taking in less of the things we need. In addition to just not getting carbohydrates, which I can explain why our body uses them, a lot of our carbohydrate, well, all of our carbohydrate foods also contain other vitamins, minerals, things that also function in the body. So if we're eating just straight fat and protein and not getting those carbs, we're actually missing a ton of vitamins and minerals that we're not going to get from those fat and protein foods that are essential to our body's functioning. And so then, you know, someone might say, well, then I'll just take a multivitamin or something. And I mean, to be fair, I think a lot of the people that are on these diets are on a lot of crazy supplements that they don't need. One of my goals is getting people off of pills and supplements and things because you can get everything through food if you're doing it properly. The vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, all that stuff that's in our food, it's not just an isolated ingredient. It's not like we just take calcium and plop it into our body and it works. It works in conjunction with other components that are in our foods like calcium and vitamin D work really well together to help each other with absorption. And there's other things in our food that assist with that as well that we can't really manufacture and put into a pill. And, you know, we also have things like if we're talking about calcium, like iron competes for binding sites with calcium. So if we're taking our iron and calcium in a supplement together, then we're not absorbing the full amount of either one of them. And we're having malnutrition that way. Like, and this is just like, that's just talking about one specific mineral. This is happening with everything. So we're already, we're hitting malnourishment from calorie deprivation, from vitamins and minerals and other components in food when we're cutting out carbohydrates. And then our body is not functioning as well. Um, A lot of people talk about getting the quote unquote keto flu when they first start this diet and it's their body is not happy. Like we are designed to 
consume majorly carbohydrates. You know, the average person, assuming they're eating enough calories for their body, is consuming 45 to 60% of their daily calories from carbohydrates. That's what it's intended to be. That is how our human body functions really well. And when we're taking that down to like 10%, our, our body's not functioning very well. Carbohydrates also bind to water, so they help keep us hydrated. So if we have our carbs and our water you know, bound in our body and we remove the carbohydrates, the water weight falls off very quickly, which is what usually accounts for that really rapid weight loss in any of our low carb diets in that first couple of days. You know, people are like, oh, I lost six pounds in a day, probably all water because it's not, it's not binding to anything and it takes a little more work to keep it in the body. So you're dehydrating yourself, which also is going to make you cranky and all the things that come with dehydration. And our preferred fuel source is carbohydrates. So our body is constantly running on carbs, like just to be sitting upright right now and maintaining enough musculature to keep my head off my shoulders. <laughs> That's carbohydrate functioning right there. Um, when we're walking or doing any sort of endurance activity, that is a mix of carbs and fats happening there. Um, our brain requires about 130 grams of carbohydrate a day to function optimally. So if you're thinking, if you're talking, if you're working, if you're studying, that is a lot of carbohydrate. So if you are cutting that out, you're going to have a lot more brain fog, difficulty concentrating and memorizing things. Um, you're probably going to be really cranky. And that's, you know, just on the low level problems, then we, you know, get into long term effects that I don't know all the details on, but it can't be good. I feel like you've just opened a beautiful treasure box of information that I just want to dive into and speak to you for hours about. Because of some trend that is going on at the moment, we are now following an idea of something that is, deprives our body of vital nutrients that keep our brains functioning, you know, doing what they're supposed to do, keep our hearts beating, keep our livers and pancreases working the way they're supposed to. There's such a damaging idea of the fact that people think food equals fat, right? They don't understand that food equals cognition, you know, food equals kidneys filtering toxins correctly. And it's not just a matter of calories in, calories out. And if everyone's kind of adopting this mentality of calories in, calories out, food equals fat, and not understanding the importance of nutrition in our body's functioning, it can be incredibly challenging for a person who's trying to recover from an eating disorder because they don't understand the science behind it. They don't understand what's happening in the body. And this is why this educational element is so important. But, you know, there's also this extra layer of difficulty for a person who's recovering from an eating disorder, which is the psychological element. I mean, I'm pretty sure that when a person is really stuck in the depths of the eating disorder, their first thought isn't, hey, am I treating my body the right way? You know, it's it's probably not on that level. And so it, even if they had this kind of information, I wonder how much they would want to or be motivated to recover so recognizing the fact that correct nutrition is so important for cognitive functioning. And obviously, if you're eating properly, it's going to help you on a psychological level as well. So I'm just interested, the clients that you come that the clients that you see, what psychological shifts and thinking patterns do you observe once they start eating correctly? Oh, what a great question. Um, I want to kind of set up the background of what they come in like before we get to that point too, because as we just talked about like the, the psychological effects of nutrition. So as I was talking about kind of the brain function, as we were talking about keto, this is also something that just happens in malnourishment. If you're not consuming enough calories, period, brain function really declines. So there was studies done that in as few as 10 weeks of calorie restriction, the brain actually physically starts to shrink and cognitive functioning shrinks. And the longer restriction goes on, the more and more rigid thinking becomes to the point where logic is completely out the window. And this is really, I believe, how eating disorders 
kind of snowball and get worse and worse and worse because the there's just an inability to kind of logic your way out of it to really grasp onto the science of it. So I think that's why it's incredibly important for people to get help as early on as possible. Like we need to get better at assessing and diagnosing and getting people in to receive help as as soon as possible and take that stigma away. Like that's stuff that I'm super passionate about because the longer this goes on, the harder it is to treat. So what we're seeing as people do start to, you know, re-nourish their body to to understand this and that it takes a lot of buy-in. <laughs> it takes a lot of tiny wins. Like I, my big focus is not on, we're just going to shove a bunch of food down your throat because that's not going to work. They're going to resist. They're going to get angry. Um, we have to build on small wins. And what I find tends to happen is it's um, kind of a slow starting process. And then it quickly picks up speed as they build that trust and self-efficacy that they can do the things and that it's not causing them to gain 20 pounds overnight or something. Um, not that weight gain is bad. Like a lot of people need to gain weight. Um, I'm all for finding your happy weight. So we don't need to know what it is on a scale. We need to find what's sustainable for you. But finding that through, okay, if they're you know, not eating very much, if we add a piece of cheese in the day and we do that for a week and they come back and they're like, all right, like I felt you know, I felt like I had a little more energy after that. I was able to make it through my afternoon class and Hey, I didn't gain weight from that. And they're like, okay, like that was adding something. Maybe I can add something else now. And then so we're slowly building on that. And at some point it is my favorite thing in the whole world with people who are malnourished. It's like the lights come on. It's the They've been, oh, how to describe it? There, there's no expression on their face for so long. They're, they're just existing. There's, there's not a lot going on in the brain. And finally, they get fueled enough that they come in and it's like their eyes are open and their personality is back. And that is the coolest thing. That is my favorite part of the job is watching them come alive again. And realizing that there is life beyond their eating disorder and that there are other things to be passionate about and they don't need to be a slave to what the eating disorder voice is telling them. I love that you've spoken about this because it kind of threw me into a flashback of this moment when I was a couple of months into my own recovery and I was brushing my teeth and I looked in the mirror and I saw my eyes and I was like, whoa, someone's there. No one had ever been there before. You know, I could see myself. I could see a more vibrant and happy and whole version of me staring back at me. So I can definitely relate to this idea of coming in and not, you know, having maybe a co-occurring illness, um, mental health issues, depression, anxiety, that kind of stuff. And I'm just thinking, you know, it must be quite hard for the individual and I guess a professional to differentiate between what is being caused on a brain or cognitive, cognitive or mental health level, what is being caused by malnutrition and what is already existing in the first place. So like how much could our nutrition and the way we eat start improving the way that we think about the world, the way that we respond, the way that we react and how we regulate emotions even. And I guess this is where you often have to bring in an entire team just to know, you know, what's psychiatric issues, what's um, psychological issues, what's malnutrition issues. Um, so do you work with a team when you're working with an individual? Absolutely. Eating disorders have to be a team approach. Um, it's, it's doing a disservice and honestly a danger, like ethical, ethically, I think it's dangerous to not have a team approach. Um, so I say basically all of my clients at minimum, if, you know, obviously they're working with me, a dietitian, they also have a therapist and some sort of medical professional as a minimum. Um, so they have, you know, their general doctor or nurse practitioner, maybe they're working with a specialist or something. Um, I find that in our kind of small town area, we don't have any eating disorder expert doctors or medical people. So they're really relying um, particularly on the dietitian to help um, assess with, obviously we can't make a diagnosis or anything, but we're saying, you know, we need you to run these specific labs. We 
you know, and tell them what's going on there. Or just because their labs are perfect does not mean they're okay. Please don't tell them that they're fine. But, you know, obviously we're working also with psychiatrists, coaches, um, specialists, depending on what other things they have going on, neurologists, GIs, endocrinologists, like whatever other things are going on with the individual. And I think to your point of the psychology and with malnourishment and everything is the American Psychological Association even put out a statement that in order for traditional talk therapy to work, nutrition rehabilitation needs to have happened because of what we were talking about with the cognitive piece. If they're not present, if their brain is not functioning, they're not going to be able to work through the other psychological pieces of this. They're not going to be able to work on their trauma or whatever else is going on. So we need to get them fed enough that therapy can really take effect. And that's not saying that they're not doing therapy the whole time. They should be, but it's going to take a little while before that I think becomes super effective. So usually the dietitian's role might be shorter than the other professionals because we're kind of more in there on the beginning and you know as needed for the rest of the time but therapy obviously can go on for a lifetime and probably should but we're playing you know a major role in all of the psychological pieces as well and you know if nothing else making referrals to the appropriate you know therapists and other team members um, to get that help in there. I mean, that's incredibly valuable information to have. And uh, sorry to backtrack a little bit, but I was just thinking as you were talking about this idea of, you know, people thinking carbohydrates are bad and this difficulty that a lot of people experience in early recovery is things like bloatedness, uh, digestive issues, and um, even refeeding syndrome and stuff like that. And, you know, you, you mentioned that carbohydrates bind to water and it can feel like there's maybe a, a water weight that's carried through through that. And maybe this attests to the idea of recovery bloat or, I mean, maybe it doesn't, I'm not sure, I'm not the dietitian, but maybe you could explain to me a little bit about the bodily changes people experience in recovery and what they can expect and what you, what you see happening. Uh, well, I'm going to really quickly address refeeding syndrome because I don't really work with that. So as an outpatient dietitian, if they're at a point where they're going to be experiencing refeeding syndrome, I'm probably not the one seeing them. That would be a much higher level of care. They're probably in a hospital, hopefully. <laughs> um, so I don't deal with that too much. So my memory of what happens with that is a little fuzzy. So, but I can speak to the rest of that for sure. Yeah. So it's actually really interesting, the, the body and GI changes that happen going particularly from malnourishment in recovery Um, I suppose this happens kind of with any of the types of eating disorders, but we see it most pronounced in people who have really, really restricted. And the recovery bloat that you're talking about, it's really interesting because as the body, this is really well documented, as the body starts to take in nutrients again, first of all, I think the there's this major fear that there's going to be this gigantic weight gain because I went from eating so tiny to so much. And, you know, and we don't tend to see that on the scale per se, but I think a lot of people notice that, oh my gosh, my pants are really tight all of a sudden or things like that. And if we look at the person very commonly, not everyone, but very commonly, we see more torso gain and the arms and legs stay very slim for the beginning phase of this. And it seems to be kind of a protective thing. So not only are we, you know, getting some of that fluid back in, which is good, but the, I I don't even know if it's, it's not fat per se, but like the weight distribution is kind of funky at the beginning. And I think this can take like six months to a year to kind of even out again, but weight gain tends to come very centralized because that's where it's more needed. We need to cushion the organs. We need to be fueling all the organs. Um, our glycogen storage is in our liver and muscle cells. Like, so we're, we're getting everything to the center of the body where it's going to be most useful. And then as our body decides that, okay, we're going to keep feeding it. <laughs> this is not going anywhere. Then the weight gain tends to redistribute more evenly and then the arms and legs will fill out and it will all kind of even out and get proportional again. Um, I definitely remember this in myself 
in recovery. It was like, I look like a, a tick, like I, I have this bloated body and these little stick arms and legs. And it's like, what is this? <laughs> and now, look, now that I've seen it on clients too, I'm like, oh, this is just the body, like kind of in shock. It's, it's like a shock to the system that we've been restricted for so long. We don't trust that this food is going to keep coming. So our body, we need to trust our body that it's going to do good by us and our body needs to trust us that we're going to feed it. And so I think until there's, and this is why like my number one thing with everyone is consistency. Like you, you must eat multiple times every day. We need to get consistent so that your body can trust that you're going to continue feeding it. And it knows when to expect nutrients coming in, fuel coming in so that it can function. So with that consistency, everything gets better. So not only does the weight distribution even out, but getting to your point on, you know, digestion and bowel movements and everything, um, really commonly, we also see constipation in the early stages of recovery, which to the eating disorder may prompt people like trying laxatives or things like that. So you're like, oh, something's messed up. That's actually the worst thing you can do at this point. Um, in the short term, like a mild laxative, like magnesium or something, if you know deemed appropriate by your doctor or dietitian, you know, occasionally. But this is not where you want to get hooked on laxatives because what's happening is our digestive tract is a series of muscles, and just like any other muscle you'd work at the gym, it's kind of use it or lose it. So if we're not consistently putting food in, those muscles are atrophying, and if we're not putting in larger amounts of food that would be like a normal amount, our body's not used to breaking down that much food. And so it actually the in restriction, our digestion is slowed down a lot. So our body wants to keep it in our stomach and in our small intestine as long as possible to absorb every little nutrient that it possibly can. So it goes really, really slow. And by the time it gets down into the colon, it is so dried up that there's constipation. So then we start adding in more food and before the body is able to catch up with, okay, this is normal again. Now all of a sudden we're getting more of a backup of that. And so it's going to be more painful constipation early on. And this is not with everyone, but this is something kind of common. And it's kind of one of those things where like, it's going to be bad before it gets better. It's going to get worse before it gets better because the, the body just needs to realize that there's food coming in and it needs to move a little faster. So yeah, that would probably be the most common digestive thing I see. Mm, yeah, I definitely experienced that as well. I mean, there was one point in early recovery where I was eating again and I had such bad constipation. Sorry for the overshare. But I was hospitalized because it was two weeks before I saw any bowel movement. And my initial eating disorder brain told me, well, you see, this is what food does to you. It makes you not able to function and it makes you uncomfortable. And and I was confusing constipation with um, feeling like I'd gained weight and all of that stuff. And I thought my body was the enemy, you know, and I think that what we need to realize is that every single thing that our body does in response to what we eat, how we move, um, how we sleep, everything is designed to try and respond in a way that can protect us. You know, it's, it's ultimately trying to say, well, either something's up and wrong and I'm trying to recorrect or rebalance, or it's reacting in a responsive, like fighting way. Um, so like inflammation and kind of stuff like that. And, It definitely speaks into this idea of in the beginning of recovery, you really need to trust the process. You need to trust that your body is not your enemy. It's not trying to hurt you. It's trying to heal you. It's trying to restore balance. And through that, you're going to probably experience some wonky like symptoms and feelings. And it can be very scary for a person coming into recovery thinking, you know, I'm doing something to make my body feel better, but in actual fact, it starts feeling worse from the get go. And, you know, a person with an eating disorder isn't coming without any psychological or emotional issues as well. And now maybe they're trying to deal with family issues or trauma or something. And now they're starting to feed their bodies correctly and their bodies react in a way that is very foreign. And I can only imagine that that exacerbates the emotional distress. So 
obviously the educational element around food in our body is really important, but how do you really navigate a person's emotional response to their physical changes in the beginning of their recovery and how how you really safeguard them against what can go on in the brain when it gets scared because of the changes. People might even sink, sink into deeper depression or they might start thinking of things like self-harm. And, you know, obviously the, the idea that the body has been the enemy and now it's drastically changing. How do you help people with that? Oh, this is such a big topic and I hope you're putting trigger warnings on the beginnings of these podcasts. Um, I think, I mean, just across the board, whether or not someone ever does become suicidal and hopefully not, um, social support is so important. So going into recovery or even if you're just in your eating disorder or in any mental thing, like having people that you trust that you can talk to I think this is just something everyone should have is having safe people to talk to. And if it needs to start out with maybe getting a therapist and that's your only safe person because no one in your life is, but hopefully developing friendships or having family members that you feel safe with that even if you're not talking, you can just go and be with them and have that safe place to land so that you don't do anything stupid and you feel supported. I think that's probably one of the biggest pieces of prevention, having people you trust who believe you that you can always go to is so important. The The co-occurring um, suicidal pieces with eating disorders, it's so prevalent. Um, I would say almost every week I'm talking with a client who has, if nothing else, a, a, an ideation, a, a passing thought about it, if not actively um, going towards it and having a plan. And that's, again, I think why the team approach is imperative. Um, so as a dietitian, we're not trained in working with suicide. Um, I've never had a formal training in it, which I really should get. Um, I've had to talk a lot of people down, uh, but this is where, you know, we want to have the therapist, we want to have emergency people available um, to step in for crisis intervention and make sure that that person is safe. But eating disorders, it's just, it's so prevalent. You know, anorexia nervosa has the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric illness. And I think it's, I don't know the percentages, but it's pretty split between two reasons for that mortality. One is suicide and another one is sudden cardiac death because the heart just stops working with such malnutrition. But we really need to look at that suicide piece because we can, you know, hopefully we're getting people in early enough that we can stop the heart problems. And that's, you know, my role as a dietitian is to really work on that piece. But the suicide piece is every, every person in the community needs to be a part of that. And we need to look at kind of why is the eating disorder developing in the first place? I mean, that's, I think, a major call for help in general. And if that's not being addressed, there's other things not being addressed. So there's that suicidality piece to it that again, not everyone experiences, thank God, but it is unfortunately common. And I think if we look at why did the eating disorder develop, what else is going on in their life? Obviously, eating disorder or not, there are much higher rates of um, suicide and suicidal thoughts in the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, I run a support group for that community of eating disorders as well. And so I think, again, it goes back to that social support of do these people really feel wanted, like they have a place that they're appreciated in life? Again, especially with anorexia, there's such a perfectionistic personality type with that. So if they're pushing themselves and they're not getting any feedback that, hey, you're doing good work, that's pushing them to a breaking point. And does that breaking point get to, oh, maybe it's better if I'm just not here. So we need to look at how are we talking to people too. Yeah, well, I think the thing that you really highlighted there is so important is this idea of having a support system when you're going through any mental health struggle. But I think the unfortunate thing is, you know, we are dealing with eating disorders and mental health issues that perhaps stem from an environment where there hasn't been a a steady and helpful support system. There aren't people encouraging them. And there's perhaps even people exacerbating or, or enabling or worsening their situation. 
you know, I think for any person who is struggling with mental health issues and who doesn't have a support system like that, it can be incredibly challenging. So maybe you can speak into this a little bit. And I have personal experience as well is that, you know, maybe if you don't have physical people, the one thing you can always turn to is this idea of creative expression. And, you know, I've always had this kind of metaphor that I see in my head of the fact that when we when we are not creatively expression, expressing ourselves, so we aren't using our voice, we aren't saying, hey, this is who I am and it's okay, we are then like kind of metaphorically cutting our head and our heart off from each other. You know, it's this, the neck, the throat. And when we cut our head and our neck when we cut our heart and our head off from each other, we're not being able to truly connect and and to heal. And, you know, this idea that the throat is also the place where we receive food, you know? So if we have a problem with creative expression, using our voice um, or using our identity or who we are and saying to the world that this is who we are, we suppress ourselves, then we might have a problem with the physical throat, you know, (laughs) where the place we receive food. So just speaking about the idea of food and the relationship to it and the relationship to our creative self and the relationship to our head and our heart connection. What is your personal kind of experience with creative expression as a healing modality for eating disorders? You know, you said you're in a musical. Can you tell me about the musical you're doing or or how you creatively express yourself? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yes. And I I mean, first of all, I love that analogy of the throat being where the food comes in. It connects the head and the heart. And I've never thought of it that way. I love that. Oh, my gosh. Um, Yeah. I mean, I think there's a reason that so many types of treatment and everything have art therapy or music therapy or drama therapy or things like that, because creative expression, I think is super important. And I remember watching a TED, I think it was a TED talk actually on this young woman who developed her restrictive eating disorder from a place of women in her family being kind of shut down, not allowed to speak. And so she had watched all the women in her family slowly shrink and shrink and shrink and not speak and their voices diminish, diminish, diminish. And so she decided to use her voice. And that was kind of the tipping point for her family not continuing down that path. So I think the voice and being able to express yourself is super important. So to get to your other point. So yes, I am all musical theater all the time. My sub brand is the Broadway Dietitian. So I love working with performers as well. But my my background, I've been in dance since I was three and I've been doing musical theater. Um, I mean, I started in sixth grade, but essentially since high school. And currently I'm in, in rehearsals for production of Carousel in our community. And for me, theater is, I mean, obviously such a joy just in general, but in terms of how it kind of affects me, I think of it as a form of therapy for myself. Because when I step into rehearsal or on stage, whatever part we're at, it is so unlike any other part of life. We turn off our phones, they're away. We are completely present in the moment. We're having this shared experience with other people, and we're becoming another character. So all of our stuff gets left at the door. And for a couple hours, you get to not only be fully present and I keep saying shared experience because I think that is something that we're really lacking with the the phone culture these days but you also get to play out someone else's life and I think that helps us understand other people better you know it's like when you walk a mile in someone else's shoes sort of thing So it helps us understand where people are coming from. It helps us understand ourselves better. Um, And it's it's just so beautiful. And then, of course, music, singing, dancing, that's such an endorphin boost, um, such a dopamine hit for my brain. Like I, I, you know, I think most people, we love listening to music. As humans, we love music. We love feeling a rhythm. We like 
hearing lyrics that we can relate to, it can bring a lot of joy. It can bring a lot of emotion. Like there's a lot of sad songs in the show um, to the point where, you know, even if we're not in the scene, if we're listening to these actors doing these scenes and these songs, like we're, we're on the sides crying with them. And it's, it's experiencing that full range of emotion in a really safe place. Like, you know, it's scripted, you know, what's coming next. So you can really let yourself go there knowing that you can be brought out of it as well. Um, it's just, um, theater is so magical and so beautiful and it's, it's fleeting. Um, it's not captured like a movie. So that experience, like even in the audience, you're watching a show that will never be exactly the same again. If you came to every performance of that show with that same cast, every single performance would be slightly different. And I think that's really beautiful. You know, I really love what you're saying there. And what I'm hearing is this ability to, through the creative process of, of acting in theater, and I guess anyone's creative process, is this ability to lose yourself in a myriad of complex emotions in a safe space. And I guess that's really what we need to be able to do in eating disorder recovery is experience a large variety of emotions in a way that feels safe and comfortable in a way that we can be explorative and, and expressive and what better place to do it than in the arts it also speaks into this workshop that i give called the three c's of recovery which is connection uh, to the self to the thoughts the body whatever it is so connection community which is the ability to be with others and to feel a sense of belonging and a sense of community and a sense of companionship and then the last c would be this idea of creative expression and how it's really important for us to focus on on all three areas of our lives in these ways because when these three C's are in balance, that's when we really start to thrive as individuals. And I guess this idea of creative expression speaks even more into the fact that we can't be creative beings while we are stuck in rigidity. In order to feel really free, we need to be able to move and to flow. And this is something that you embody with the theater that you do. And I'm very certain that this process of creative expression and this ability to connect with oneself and one's artistic self has really helped your recovery. What I often see a lot of people experience is this physical rigidity. So and I'm sure in theater, you're, you're moving around a lot, you're, you're expressing yourself, you're uh, singing, you're dancing. And, and when people are stuck in rigidity, there's very little movement, there's very little flow. And when you don't allow yourself to be in this flow in to actually actively seek the creative self, I think you are more likely to stay stuck in whatever rigidity or pattern or fear that you have self-created or that you have fallen into. And so it's really wonderful for you as a professional to be saying, hey, this is something that I have recognized as important in my personal journey and it can actually inspire others. And, you know, the work that you do, you actually help people in the theater world um, who do struggle with long hours and not knowing how to sustain themselves, um, how to nourish themselves and how to do this in a healthy way, even though there's a lot of external pressures in in the creative world, um, in the theatrical world to to go, 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 to look a certain way, to eat a certain way, and to basically operate on 100% regardless of your energy levels at all hours of the night. So <laughs> it's wonderful that you're able to actually help people through this kind of stuff as well. And before we start to wrap up for today's podcast episode, I would love to ask you if you have any words of inspiration, any message that you'd like to share, or perhaps a pivotal point in your personal journey that you would like to express and, and tell others about that might act as a inspiration for their journey. <laughs> How much time you got? <laughs> There's so much. Um, you know, I'm going to go somewhere really different than I think I've ever ended one of these podcast episodes. And it goes back to how we were talking about expressing emotion. I think not only are people in their eating disorder really afraid of expressing emotion, but we get, you know, that, that cognitive malfunctioning. It feels like we can only experience the highest highs and the lowest lows. And we're missing that whole area in the beginning. And that, you know, really lends itself to that black and white or all or nothing thinking. And a lot of people talk about like black and white and then the gray area in between. 
I think the gray area sounds really boring. I like to think of it as experiencing all of the rainbows of life in between the black and the white, because there is so much life, so much emotion that is in between the black and the white. And if we only live in the black and the white, we're not experiencing life in full color. It's like in the movie, The Wizard of Oz, when she goes from black and white into the colorful land of Oz, like you can have all the beautiful, shiny, glittery life and experiencing that. And it's okay to feel emotions. It's okay to cry. Emotions change. You're not going to stay stuck in any one emotion forever. And if you kind of allow yourself to move through that, you're actually going to do a lot better. Because if you feel like you're going to stay stuck, that's when things become feeling more hopeless. That's when things tend to spiral for the worst. Just kind of take that even a step further. Like for me, getting diagnosed with depression was actually a really great thing because I hadn't been able to figure out why I was feeling these certain feelings. It's very like melancholy. And I'd be like, oh, like my day is awful. Like I'm never going to feel good again. And once I figured out it was depression and I could understand that, it was like, oh, this is more like ocean waves. Like right now I'm in a high wave of depression, but it's going to go away again. And once I understood that, I was able to just kind of ride the waves and, you know, find those smart coping skills, but know that the waves are going to subside again. So I think my message is just one of hope that nothing is forever. What an incredibly beautiful message to share. And I think this not only speaks into the emotional side of the things that we go through, but also the physical side, which is equally as important. I mean, flip, there's so many things that we deal with on a physical level when we come into eating disorder recovery. We might have gastrointestinal problems or bloating or weight changes and fluctuations or even things like anxiety and panic attacks. And it's just, for me, it's so important to recognize the impermanence of this all. And what beautiful way to express that or to kind of metaphorically look at that is the idea of theater, um, an act, a performance, an art piece. And no one instance is the same and no one thing is, is permanent. I mean, you can have the same show for a hundred nights in a row and every single performance will be different. There will be different moments of emotion. There'll be different things you mess up on or different things that get applauded. And, and so this impermanence of things that happen on a physical level can also be metaphorically seen as the, the, the creative self. If I am engaging in the creative self, I am embodying the idea of impermanence and I'm okay with it. So thank you so much for that message specifically. Um, I would love to know where we can get a hold of you. How can we contact you, social media handles or anything like that? Yes. Well, thank you so much for this interview. First of all, this was so much fun and I love getting to know new people. So it's great. So the, the places you can find me, um, I have two main websites and I guess two main Instagram handles as well then. So they match. So notyouraveragenutritionist.com and at notyouraveragenutritionist on Instagram. That is my main business. I have a team of dietitians. We work with eating disorders and a few other conditions. And you can learn all about us there, including you can learn more about my book, Permission to Eat, which is available on Amazon. Hopefully I'll be working on an audiobook version maybe end of this year or next year, but right now it's on all the um, normal ways of reading a book. And I have some online programs available as well. I'm working on a prep school for people going into college on just kind of basic adulting skills from a non-diet perspective. So that's coming up. And then my other site is thebroadwaydietitian.com and at thebroadwaydietitian on Instagram. And the Instagram is really more of my personal and acting life, but the website is a blog and my services as a theater dietitian. So not specific to eating disorders, but weight inclusive or non-diet um, health for performers. I'm actually working on a book and a college curriculum right now. Um, basically the health class that you never got specific to people who are on stage. So how to make it through long rehearsals, um, how to avoid digestive issues on stage, all of that kind of stuff. So you can find out more about me over there. I feel like I have more things in progress, but uh, if you follow me on Instagram, you will hear all about the things that I'm working on. 
Um, and I can be contacted that way or my email is on the website as well. Thank you so, so much, Libby Parker, for being on the show today and for sharing us sharing with us your incredible information. It has been such a pleasure and I'm absolutely certain that people will have benefited from this and especially those people that are in the arts and in theatre. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for listening to today's podcast. If you have liked it, share it with people who you think might benefit from listening to it as well. Don't forget to go to my Instagram page called at Curious About Recovery to find out about upcoming episodes or to browse the episodes of the past. You can also follow my coaching page called at Kirsten Honeyball where you can get inspiration for your eating disorder recovery. 